The road to the dark side is often paved with good intentions. For many Jedi, this was a lesson they learned the hard way. When one was gifted with great power, they felt the need to use it for good. However, power corrupts even those with the purest of hearts, and those who were sort of great to begin with stood even less of a chance. There are more than a few stories of Jedi who try to do the right thing in a very wrong way, and that was exactly the case with the Jedi we'll be talking about today. In today's video, we'll be talking about Rana Te, a Jedi master who let her hatred of the Sith get the better of her and lead her to murdering some Padawans before Skywalker made it cool. Attention, Sergeant on deck! Rana Te, a female Togruta, was born on the planet Shili after the Great Sith War. As a child, she suffered from terrible headaches and nightmares that left the doctors on her homeworld stumped. When a Jedi came across her, however, they suspected her condition was actually caused by Force visions due to her natural Force sensitivity. The young girl was taken to Coruscant, where she was trained by Jedi Master Krinda Dre, who confirmed the Jedi's theory and took the girl under her wing. During her treatment, Tay attended therapy with Dre's other students and learned healthy coping mechanisms to deal with her everyday life. This gift of normalcy was more than the Togruta could ever have hoped for and it left her feeling indebted to her beloved master. Under her master's guidance, she soon grew to be one of the Order's most powerful seers. Now, Krinda Dre had a bit of a personal mission. After the Great Sith Wars, the master was hell-bent on preventing the return of the Sith. To this end, she formed a group called the Circle of the Jedi Covenant, also referred to as the First Watch. This group was made up of five Jedi Seers, all former students of hers. Together, these five, which included Tay, Kuanilia, Zamar, Feln, and Lucian Dre, and his own son, were devoted to seeing their master's mission through. This tight-knit group was an incredible support system for Tay, to the point where she relied on them completely for her mental health. Although their organization remained secret, the five were always together, which seems strange to the High Council. Spurred on by her Togruta nature and the force of her visions, Tay established herself as a wild and aggressive fighter. She was ferocious and quick to spring to action or to anger. That said, she wasn't the strongest in the group. That title belonged to Lucian Dre. Everything seemed to be going well for the Circle, at least until Kuanilia and Krinda Dre had a shared vision. They called this vision the Prophecy of the Five, as it involved five people who found themselves on different sides of the Force. Somehow, all these powerful seers failed to make a connection. Eventually, the five were assigned to Taurus, where each of them took on a Padawan. When their students were taking their night trials, the seers meditated together to see into their students' future. What they saw, however, was a nightmare to come. Tay had a vision of herself on Tyrus attacked by Mandalorians and Sith. A Sith attacked her from behind and killed her with their saber. The others all had similar visions. One common element was that the Sith was wearing the same distinct red suit their Padawans were currently wearing. Terrified this meant the return of the Sith, Tay wanted to execute their students immediately. Instead, the group returned to Tyrus with them, scheming behind their backs. Krinda Dre denounced their plan, but the Circle didn't listen. They were going to murder each and every one of their Padawan during their knighting ceremonies and end the Sith threat before it began. Their students, however, sensed something was amiss. One of them, Zane Karak, was clearly not ready to be knighted, yet the Masters were going to do it anyway. When questioned, the Masters tried to string together some BS about him having a strong connection to the Force, but the students found it all mad sus. Really, the Masters had no choice but to murder them at that point. When Karak, who was running late to the ceremony, arrived in the Jedi Tower, he found them standing over the bodies of his dead friends, lit sabers in hand. Like any sane person would have done, he ran. The Masters, of course, didn't like this. They pursued Karak and his business associate, Man Harigriff, all across the planet. They also contacted the Taurus civil authorities, claiming Karak was responsible for the Taurus Padawan massacre, as it came to be known, and enlisted their aid to capture him. Although they cornered him in the lower city, he managed to escape with the help of two new friends. 
When the fugitives hid an asteroid field around the planet, the next logical step was to place bounties on their heads. Valius Ying, a bounty hunter, eventually captured Carrick and brought him to the Jedi Tower on Tyrus to be judged for his crimes. Carrick took the chance to call them out for their BS, but they didn't care. Dre was about to kill him when a figure wearing the red suit crashed through the glass ceiling, causing enough of a distraction for Carrick and the intruder, one of his new friends, to escape on a shuttle. Following these events, enough civil unrest broke out on the planet to force the Jedi to take their leave. Even worse, Carrick sent to Circle a message containing his own prophecy. They would all be hunted down and killed until one of them cleared his name. Tay, who had already been in questionable mental health, deteriorated even more. After Tyrus, the group returned to Coruscant, where the High Council was rather displeased. They were scolded for having utterly failed as instructors to their students, and for the first time, they were separated and sent out on different assignments. Their pleas to lead the search for Carrick fell on deaf ears. Even their master, Krinder Dre, refused to see them. Tay, not one to ever listen to her superiors, took matters into her own hands. She confided in Lucian Dre, who agreed on the condition their involvement was kept secret. Her plan involved using the Dre Trust, a company Lucian's father had founded to team up with others such as Zerk Corporation and Adascorp. Through the company, they bought a bank on Carrick's home planet, and through the bank, they targeted his father, Arvin Carrick. They transferred him off-world and set bounty hunters to watch him in case his son came looking for him. These hunters, however, were a few credits short of a stack and took that as, please kidnap your target. This understandably pissed Tay off, who ordered them to sit tight, stay awake, and not do anything else stupid until they came to deal with the captive. Unfortunately for her though, Zane Carrick had already arrived on the planet, learnt of his father's capture, and listened in on this conversation. She couldn't have put a bigger target mark on her forehead if she'd tried. Tay herself was struggling. Separated from her teammates, her nightmares worsened to the point where she could barely function. Meditation did nothing, and she refused to even really try it. The only cure, she thought, was to kill Carrick. On a mission for the Chancellor, she returned to Tyrus in search of a missing senator. At the time, the planet was under siege by the Mandalorians, led by Cassius Fett. Her missing senator, it turned out, was Planetside, leading the resistance. While there, she contacted Shel Jelavan, the sister of one of the dead Padawans, and told her of Carrick's betrayal. Thanks to plot contrivance, however, Carrick also came to Tyrus to team up with the Hidden Bex, a lower city gang, and offer their help to the Resistance. The moment he showed his face, Jelavan shot him point blank. Tay emerged from the crowd of onlookers, saber drawn, and ordered her to shoot the stunned Carrick again. Carrick, however, had the Tyrus gang and Hierogriff with him, as well as one of the bounty hunters Tay had sent after his father. The latter wanted the bounty for himself, and Tay, still pissed he'd messed everything up, lost her Sith and went for him instead of Carrick. The fight was enough for Hierogriff to disarm Jelavan. The stalemate was broken when the senator came out to see what the commotion was about and told Tay to back off. In anger, she pointed out Carrick and his gang were fugitives. The gang, whose help would make a huge difference, declared they would only stay if Carrick was left alone, and the senator accepted their condition, much to Tay's chagrin. She still believed 100% that Carrick was a Sith. When she overheard him and Jelavan discussing the Padawan massacre, she intervened to argue with Carrick. She claimed she didn't kill Jelavan's brother, which was true, since she'd murdered a different Padawan that day. Carrick and Tay bickered until Jelavan stormed off. Meanwhile, the Resistance had located to the Mandalorian's command center, which was in the old Jedi Tower. Initially, Tay refused to get involved, since the Jedi Order was staying oh so typically neutral. In the end though, she agreed to lead them through a hidden passage to the tower, thinking this would be a fine chance to murder her scapegoat. Feeling her death was imminent, Tay took Jelavan aside and pleaded for her to finish Carrick off if she failed. She even taught her how to restore her dead brother's lightsaber so she could use it to get the job done. The Togruta took one way into the tower while Jelavan and Carrick took another. The moment they were all in, she rushed to kill him. In the council chamber, she lunged at him, yelling that she would kill the one to bring the Sith back. 
She was far too powerful for him to face head on, so he tried using a jetpack to outmaneuver her. Still, she managed to disarm him, forcing him to rely on a blaster. Panicked, Carrick tried to invoke the Jedi teachings to bring her back to her senses, but all it did was enrage her further. She hurled him into a glass ceiling, then retrieved his saber and recited the prophecy of the five to him. To Carrick, this was obviously about the five traitorous evil Jedi masters, but Tay was completely convinced it was Carrick and his four friends that would destroy the Order and the Republic. As she raised the two sabers to deal the killing blow, Jelivan stabbed her through the back with her murdered brother's saber, bringing an end to the insane master's rampage. At that moment, Carrick's allies arrived to rescue them. As they were escaping though, Tay managed to stand up despite her mortal injury and tried to pursue them. Despite everything she had put him through, Carrick still tried to save her. Tay thought this was another ploy to get her to confess, but Carrick shook his head. All he wanted was for the senseless killing to stop. Enough blood had been spilled. Suddenly, the Togruta's sight cleared and she realized that she'd been wrong all along. The rush of guilt incited her to flee rather than face the truth, but she was caught in the rubble. She raised her saber to cut herself free, but Hero Griff, thinking she was about to attack Carrick, detonated the explosives they had planted to destroy the Mandalorian's command center. Sensing she was about to die, the only thing Tay asked was for Carrick to tell her former master, Grinder Dre, that she was sorry for everything. She died alone, plagued by guilt. With great power comes great responsibility. Rana Tay was an excellent example of someone who should never have been allowed to amass that much power. She and her group grew conceited and they thought they could impose their will on the Force. But all they managed to accomplish was a self-fulfilling prophecy that brought only death and pain to an already suffering order. But what do you think? Do you know any other Jedi that went way off the deep end to accomplish a seemingly noble goal? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.